Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 221 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Julian Guthrie. She's an award winning journalist who spent 20 years at the San Francisco Chronicle. And her writing has also appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Huffington Post, and Salon.com. And we'll be speaking with her today about her new book, How to Make a Spaceship, A Band of Renegades, An Epic Race, and the Birth of Private Spaceflight, which tells the amazing true story of Peter Diamandis and the X-Prize. And now, here's our interview with Julian Guthrie. All right, so we're here with Julian Guthrie. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be on your show. Okay, so your Twitter account describes you as friends of the world's greatest geeks. So how did you become friends with the world's greatest geeks? Oh my gosh, I love that question. I think really just my curiosity led me to interview a ton of people who happen to be geeks. They're really good at what they do and they're super obsessed with what they're doing. And being based in the San Francisco Bay Area, I also um, came across a lot of techies, a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, a lot of folks who were doing startups, um, and then, you know, a lot of industry leaders I encountered as well. So I just seemed to gravitate toward those, uh, kind of obsessive types, I guess. <laughs> and are you a big geek yourself? I am a big geek. I have to admit it. Um, I think this is something that I'm just acknowledging, like just feeling good about talking about because I'm so obsessed with my own work and bringing something to life that didn't exist before and toiling away and, you know, all hours of day and night to finish um, creating my book in, in this case of geekdom. Um, so I'm really obsessed about it and I work all hours and I feel very vulnerable about what, you know, I'm bringing to market. And I'm hoping that it will have longevity and even a little slice of immortality and find its its own niche and market. So um, I think I'm in that. I think I, I think the word is out. <laughs> I am in that crowd. I'm in good company, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, are you into other geeky things like science fiction or space or computers or things like that? Well, I am now into science fiction, um, just as I was getting into this story, which is about space and has you know, has space geeks galore. And um, I was reading Heinlein and Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and um, brushing up on, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid <laughs> and, and watching Star Trek episodes and, you know, realizing it's the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. So I have been um, getting into that realm more so recently, just as I've been researching the book, which, you know, has has a ton of um, of space geeks in it. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see how doing this book could lead you to Star Trek and Heinlein, because it seems like pretty much every character in this book uh, got into this because of, you know, watching the show or reading those books or something. I know, the dark forces. No, actually, it is amazing because I'd interview all of these people from all different walks of life who happen to be come together, you know, in this book, and they're all influenced by you know, Heinlein, um, Arthur C. Clarke, or, you know, on the rocket side, um, Werner von Braun, Goddard. Um, so I also became a bit of a, um, a rocket enthusiast myself. Um, but it is interesting because it shows how much those works of science fiction, um, just the imagination that was sparked in, you know, in followers, whether or in readers, whether it's Peter Diamandis, the main character of my book, or John Carmack, you know, video game legend. You know, he loved Heinlein, too. I heard that time and again. Yeah, well, so tell us a bit more about Peter Diamandis. You said he's kind of the main character. How did you first encounter him? So, Peter, I first met when I was working at the San Francisco Chronicle, where I'd been for 20 years and as a, as a daily journalist, loving my job. Um, I did a profile on Peter, and I'm I asked this seemingly simple question, how did this whole X Prize thing start? And he laughed and he told me he told me the backstory to um this private uh race to space, as he called it at the time, to offer ten million dollars for the first team non governmental that could build and fly a manned rocket to the start of space. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. I knew a little bit about it, but 
as I started getting into it, I thought that would be an amazing, uh, an amazing book. So I met him for a newspaper story and it has now led to this book. And so at that time when he established this $10 million X prize, he didn't have $10 million lying around. I mean, he was just, uh, he was sort of working for a company, you know, he was out of school. I mean, tell us about what sort of stage of life was he at when, when this all came about? Yeah, that's a great question. So he, um, so Peter Diamandis, I mean, the book opens and his story opens in, um, on July 20th, 1969, which was a seminal day. And, um, in the world of space, the day that man first stepped foot on the moon. And Peter was eight years old and he was watching um, the Apollo 11 landing. And he set out on this journey from then on. He was determined to get to space and he went to MIT and he went to Harvard and got a medical degree with no intention of ever practicing medicine, but trying to get into the astronaut corps. So by the time we see him in the early 1990s, he's like banging his head against a wall. He's not going to fly to space through NASA. NASA is winding down manned space missions. And he's thinking, I'm going to have to somehow get to space through, you know, a, a, a path other than NASA. And so that was really the start of his questioning how am I going to make that happen? And that was around, again, around 1993, early 1994. Right. And so he, but he had been the president of this national space club of college students, right? right. And... Yeah. He had, he had started this student space club um, called um, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, as he said, um, when he was at MIT. And he, you know, it became this big success. It had, you know, over 100 chapters across the country. And then he went on to launch, you know, the first international space university when he was at MIT and at Harvard. He also got a master's degree at MIT in aeronautical, um, astronautical engineering. And so his whole life pursuit was space. And, um, you know, and it just wasn't that he was not going to get into the astronaut corps. It became came evident to him. So that's where we find him at this very pivotal point. You know, how am I going to do this if the government can't take me there? Right. And he gives this talk where he's expressing his frustration with NASA. And he points out that after the moon landing, NASA had three plans for the further exploration of space. And their slow plan was to have a moon base by 1983 and a Mars expedition by 1986. So obviously that didn't happen. So why, in his view, had things not panned out the way they should have for NASA? Well, I think that, uh, you know, it, it had been a love affair for people actually across the world with the magic of NASA. And what NASA had accomplished in the 1960s was phenomenal, you know, in terms of taking risk, in terms of uh, reaping rewards, in terms of technological breakthroughs that um, had a domino effect on other industries. There was magic, you know, it was really. Arthur C. Clarke has this great line um, about, um, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's what NASA was. But by the 70s and then the 80s, late 80s, you know, you NASA had had really stopped the put a stop to the Apollo missions. And we had the space shuttle and it was over budget and it was uh, flying much less frequently than had been promised. And it was just extremely costly. And there were, um, you know, there were tragic, uh, tragic accidents uh, that had also happened with the space shuttle. So that was the realization was, you know, private citizens are not going to space anytime soon, uh, which had been the dream. And the promise that really began with that, those first steps on the moon. I mean, that's when it was really just captivating to people, including Peter Diamandis. Right. And so Peter kind of becomes captivated with three books dealing with individual accomplishment, right? The Man Who Sold the Moon by Robert Heinlein, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and The Spirit of St. Louis by Charles Lindbergh. Could you just talk a little bit about how those three books sort of formed his, his mission? Well, Heinlein, uh, you know, was, I think, just his, it, you know, it was... <laughs> He was Greek Orthodox and his family was, you know, very traditional in their religious beliefs. And Peter's Bible, 
I think it was this combined, this comp composite of the three books you referenced. Um, but he really loved Heinlein. You know, he loved The Man Who Sold the Moon in particular. And I think it just, it, it was about the possibility of getting to space privately in The Man Who Sold the Moon that, you know, really first was one of the first things that awakened him to this idea. And Atlas Shrugged is an interesting one that also became a part of his um, kind of MO, the way he operated, the way he thought. And that was because he believed in the power of the individual to accomplish what only, you know, collectivist enterprises had done before. And he felt like, um, you know, it was this David versus Goliath struggle. It was this individual versus governmental struggle as he, as he started to see it with the space industry, which was really, really interesting. Um, so that's how the, the Ayn Rand, I think, applied to him. Um, for many, many years, it was something that he kept going back to and, and reading that work, um, just again, to be reminded of the power of the individual. And, you know, other, the other books, Arthur C. Clarke's writings, um, Space Odyssey, of course. And there was another one, you know, Jerry O'Neill, the Princeton physicist, was also, um, very influential in, in Peter's thinking, along with many other, um, space aficionados and dreamers out there. Right. And then also, could you talk about the spirit of St. Louis? Because this I, I had no idea how influential the flight of Charles Lindbergh was on space on, on the X Prize. Oh, yes. Sorry, I was I was uh, focused on all of the, <laughs> the science fiction writers rather than the nonfiction writer. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting. Charles Lindbergh, the great aviator. So he also was a great writer and he wrote The Spirit of St. Louis, which won the Pulitzer Prize about his flight across the Atlantic. And so Peter was read, was gifted the book, The Spirit of St. Louis, by a good friend of his. And this was in the late, this was in late 1993, early 1994, when Peter again was thinking about, you know, how am I ever going to get to space? Anyway, so Peter was reading The Spirit of St. Louis and he read that Charles Lindbergh, along with the other aviators at that time, had f tried to fly, had flown the Atlantic Lindbergh not as a stunt, but to win a $25,000 prize, that which was offered by a French hotelier named Raymond Ortega. And nine teams, something like nine teams, had spent $400,000 to win a $25,000 prize. And Peter thought, oh my gosh, not only did, um, you know, it, it was successful, Lindbergh succeeded in this transatlantic flight. He became he became the most famous man on earth at that time, and it jump-started an industry. It jump-started the commercial aviation industry. And so Peter thought, wow, that's it. What if I could use an incentive prize to jump-start the private space industry in the same way Lindbergh's flight really made the world comfortable with commercial air travel? Right. So, so, he, so he announces this X prize, and as we've said, the only problem is that he didn't actually have $10 million. But he thinks, uh, no problem, I can raise $10 million easy. And uh, it turns out not to be so easy. I know. Isn't that something? I mean, talk about audacious. You know, he believed it was going to come true. So he, <laughs> this is just classic Peter Diamandis. He, he announces this $10 million prize. He's got 20 astronauts on stage with him. This is May 1996. He's in St. Louis in front of the arch, where is St. Louis, which is where Charles Lindbergh found his backers in the 1920s. And it's grand and it's a great ceremony. And Buzz Aldrin is there and the head of NASA, Dan Golden, and all these people. And he announces the prize. And yet, you know, he didn't have the teams. And more importantly, he didn't have the $10 million. But he believed that, you know, that he would get the money and that he would attract the teams. So then he starts out on this, you know, entrepreneurial adventure story, um, which, you know, you'll, you'll, which is plays out in the book. Right. But so the basic thing is the reason it was called the X prize is because the X was supposed to be temporary. And then the, whoever his big sponsor was would be, the prize would be named after them, but it just kind of ended up being the X prize because it took him, he just, you know, went to sponsor after sponsor and couldn't get anyone to sign on. And they were all concerned, I think that, uh, you know, if someone died, uh, you know, doing this, it would not reflect well on their company. 
Right. That's a, he knocked on, you know, hundreds of doors. He met with hundreds of CEOs. He was told no hundreds of times. And the one of the concerns, a couple of questions came up. Why isn't NASA doing this? And then what if someone dies? And, you know, he believed that, um, you know, the greatest rewards come through the greatest risks. And, you know, NASA wasn't doing this. And and that was that was one of the points. But you know, he got a rejection after rejection and things were looking really dire, you know, and, and in this, in the story, in this whole saga, I mean, you see this guy get knocked down again and again and again, emotionally he gets his hopes up, you know, he meets with all these people who thinks are going to be perfect. Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, who had started Amazon to great success already and was a space nut. And, um, he thought they're perfect. And they even said no. So, how he ends up finding his money is also a, a classic unexpected tale within the tale. But it turned out when he announced that prize, you know, he had no idea how difficult it was going to be to actually raise the 10 million. Yeah. So, so, so like the book kind of follows these parallel tracks where Peter is trying to raise the money to give the prize if anyone uh, wins. And then there are all these teams who are trying to actually, you know, um, you know, win the prize, which involves sending a ship, up past a you know certain threshold of altitude twice within a week um and i sort of imagined when i heard about the x prize when it happened i imagined all these teams were all really well funded and you know but i so i was really surprised to hear how shoestring a lot of these operations are i mean the one that really stands out to me is this guy in uh, bucharest uh dimitru popescu <laughs> i know it isn't he amazing Oh my God, Dimitri Popescu. I love his story so much. I mean, his story is amazing to this day. He's a phenomenal success story, but here's a kid who was in engineering school in Bucharest and um, he heard about that he was in a, in an internet cafe in, you know, in Bucharest, Romania. And he reads about, he's searching for some obscure thing pertaining to a missile and he's in engineering school. So there was a reason for it. And he reads about the X Prize, and he is like, "Oh my!" He calls his wife immediately. You've got to come here, you know, to because they only had internet at the cafe, and um, we have to enter this. And she looks at him like he's completely nuts, and which was the same expression everyone had <laughs> when he told them he was entering the X Prize. And then, you know, he they he and his wife convince her father, his father in law, uh, to allow them to set up their rocket shop in his backyard in the outskirts of Bucharest. So they start making these rockets, you know, and test firing rockets. And he's digging ditches for the bunkers of his, you know, rockets so they can stay safe, ostensibly. Um, he's digging the ditches himself. They're using all sorts of strange found uh, pieces, objects for, you know, the, the stand for the engine, for the hot fire tests. Uh, very risky stuff. You know, at one point the police come because there's this explosion. It shattered windows for miles around. But I love that guy. You know, I, I feel like he was so courageous and he persisted. And today he's got a big, actually, aerospace company in New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you say at one point that they can't afford eye protection, so they're just closing their eyes while they're welding. <laughs> I know it. It's true. I mean, they were, they had, they had no money. They had occasional donations. And then they had you know, they would do little fundraisers in their town and people would come by and, you know, and it was super hot in the summers and they set up their lawn chairs and watch these guys work. It was like the local entertainment. But they also, um, you know, Dimitri also had this formidable um, foe in the government, in the Romanian government, because the head of the Romanian space agency was supposed to be doing what he was trying to do. And the Romanian space agent had uh, who was Romania's only cosmonaut, he did not like what the Romanian ARCA team, they were called ARCA, were trying to do and, you know, sent them many hostile letters, um, basically, you know, telling them that uh, they could be likened to terrorists. And it was not a good situation. It was not an easy situation for Dimitri and his team of volunteers. Right. But I mean, that does. I mean, I think all of the uh, competitors face these sorts of issues, right? Like, can you just go out in your backyard and launch a missile up into space? Uh, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, you're talking about this guy, Steve Bennett, and he's concerned at one point because there's a nuclear power station five miles away from where he's launching. He's kind of like, I, I hope it doesn't hit that. I know it. Yes, Steve Bennett is another great case. I mean, that guy, you know, he was working, he's in the UK, and he had a steady job um, as a technician in a coal, the Colgate toothpaste factory. And he, but he had always loved rockets. You know, he was another one who's transfixed by this whole concept of the reality of, you know, when man first stepped foot on the moon. And, and anyway, he's working in this factory, he hears of the X Prize. And he's determined to be a, become a contender. And again, everybody thought he was nuts. And he eventually leaves Colgate, leaves this steady job, and lives on credit cards, maxes out every credit card he can, um, practically living in his car, and just to make, you know, make these rockets. And he succeeded in having the largest rocket ever fly from private private rocket ever fly from the UK mainland. And it's a great scene and you're just cheering for him. I was, I, I mean, I just think about that and I found it pretty, pretty heroic. Right, because it does seem like this X Prize unleashed this wave of creativity in all of these people. I mean, you talk about one guy who decided he was gonna launch his rocket from a balloon. Uh, one guy was gonna, from what I understood, he was just gonna have it floating in the ocean and it was gonna launch. It was all these like weird, random things. <laughs> I know there were there was just about every imaginable concept for rocket launch from air launch from sea launched from you know back of truck launched from backyard Romania launch from you know the wet sands um, in Morecambe Bay in England uh, you know where they had limited time because the tide was was threatening to come in and wash everything away and um, you had, you know, it was really this scrappy mentality which pervades the story. And it was very risky, actually. I mean, it was risky personally, it was risky financially, it was risky just because rocketry is very, very dangerous, um, especially when you're trying to build at that level. So there were huge risks taken. And miraculously, nobody. Um, there were no casualties, no serious injuries, close, but no serious injuries. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was most excited to see was that John Carmack is a pretty significant character in this story because, um, you know, I'm a big fan of his games. And we actually did an episode back in June talking about id Software and the history of John Carmack and John Romero and talking about the book Masters of Doom, which kind of ends off with him starting on this this rocket enterprise and so it was really cool to me to see that your book kind of picks up the story and shows how what happened to him when he when he gets into this uh field yeah john um i went to texas and and met with john and also went to the um this outline area where armadillo aerospace his volunteer team um still exists in different ways but i spent a good amount of time with john and and really was pretty impressed by um, his approach to rocketry, which was very methodical. It was very self-taught. He educated himself. You know, he spent thousands of dollars to buy all these seminal rocket um, textbooks and to educate himself before he started meeting with, um, with, uh, with rocket, um, you know, rocket builders, rocket makers, aerospace companies, big and small. And there was a funny scene where I remember um, John telling me that when he was first starting to go to these conferences and he's walking around and nobody knows who he is. And then then word started getting out um, that he was an accredited investor and a high value uh, individual. He made a fortune by this point in his video games, as you noted. And um, but when he started meeting with people, you know, more than once he was told, hey, you know, we don't tell you how to uh write you know do programming for video games you know don't tell us how to build rockets and but john was very undeterred and set out and studied and formed this hobby team and they had a very very uh reputable um contender in the x prize very impressive actually and they were very short on time and they were all super motivated it was a great group and John, I think, learned a lot about the coding for rocketry versus programming for games. 
Um, and he said to me that he wants to get back into rockets once, you know, he's got this virtual reality thing more, um, more behind him. But, but impressive guy. Yeah. Fascinating guy. Right. And he was saying that he thought maybe they could have won, but they ran, ran into this snag where the company wouldn't sell them the jet fuel that they needed because they were afraid of, you know, getting sued, basically. Yeah, exactly. You know, it was all these lessons learned. And I think he, you know, expected it to be less um, bureaucratic. I'm not, I think because he had worked in these small teams you know, in his programming life at id, you know, he'd worked when it was at its best, you know, he and Romero were, you know, like these great, you know, well-intentioned hackers who were just staying up all night and fueled by pizza and Coca-Cola or whatever and, and programming away. And, and it was something that was relatively immediate and bureaucrat, bureaucracy free. Um, and then he gets to rocketry and there are the launch permits and there's the regulations around um, the insurance and the regulations around propellants and all of these things, which he didn't quite anticipate um, that be, proved to be less creative hurdles and more bureaucratic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so tell us a bit about the team that ends up actually winning this thing because it's Bert Rattan, right? And his team. Right. So amazing story you know and i didn't know much about bert rattan uh before i started researching this book and so just as john carmack is a god for or a legend for he's gamers, a god to me okay yeah he is to many many people i know um you know and he, and in person he's just a really really kind and considerate person which is always nice but um that's an aside but you know, as John is, I was saying, as John is to video, God to the video game world, um, Bert Rattan is to the world of, in the world of aviation. You know, he's a design genius and, uh, truly, truly, truly. And he's a huge character, you know, one as a writer, I just loved. Um, so Bert Rattan is heading scaled composites and in the Mojave Desert, in the Badlands of the Mojave, which truly is the Badlands. I visited there many times. And he, you know, talk about Scrappy. Um, he had this team of 30 engineers who were working on the world's first private spaceship program. And they were really doing it. Um, they were trying to keep it, keep it um, under the profile, under wraps um, for as long as they could, which was very, you know, which was successful. People didn't know about it for some time. And then he was able to get this a significant benefactor, um, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, to fund his crazy, you know, spaceship program. And he comes up with this amazing, I don't know if you um, were really intrigued by the feather design like I was, but he comes up with this, this answer to the question that has vexed you know, great minds in aerospace, and that is how do you safely return man and machine to Earth um, from out of the atmosphere. And um, so he created this kind of seemingly wacky looking um, invention design to return, you know, his pilots and his spaceship back to Earth. But it was a very, very, it was a breakthrough, breakthrough innovation. Right. And even though these guys have the funding, ultimately, they're still doing all of these you know, like shoelaces and duct tape sorts of things that the other teams are doing. I mean, like you say that they're using paint parts of paintball guns for their spaceship and um, <laughs> they end up using something called body putty for heat shielding. Oh, my God. This is one of my favorite things that I landed upon that has never been reported. I mean, there was a lot that was reported about um, Spaceship One, as it's called, which was an air launched uh, rocket. There was a white knight, the mothership, and then the rocket, which was carried underneath and launched at around 50,000 feet to go up to the, the, um, the start of space, ideally. Um, but to do that, to go supersonic, you need to have some heat protection, some um, thermal protection on different parts of the, um, the vehicle, the space vehicle. And they tried all sorts of fancy 
things that, you know, had been used by NASA and, and uh, you know, they kept sending their research scientists uh, back to the lab, so to speak, to concoct the next solution. And this was one of my favorite, it really was one of my favorite things. So then um, this young engineer, Matt Steinmetz, uh, who ended up running the spaceship program, he was talking with Bert Rattan about it. And Bert's like, you know, and, and Matt was saying, nothing is working. You know, it's all peeling off. It looks awful. It's not pro- providing heat protection. And Bert said, hey, just try some body putty. Just slap some body putty on there. And Matt's like, what? Body putty? Like you use, you know, to smooth the dent in your car or something? Except it's made for airplanes. And Bert was like, yep, try it out. And so Matt, you know, he tried it out and he tried it on test models and it's like, oh my God, this actually works, body putty. So he goes back and tells Bert, and this is one of the classic scenes, and this is so epitomizes Bert Rattan. So Matt tells him and Bert's eyes light up and he's like, okay, well, it can't just be body putty. I mean, we have to have something that's, you know, proprietary and secret Mm -hmm. and top, you know, confidential. And so he said, go out and buy some cinnamon and oregano and, you know, and, and mix that up with body putty. So we have a um, proprietary formula <laughs> <laughs> and they literally did, you know, and the cinnamon added the, you know, the pinkish hue that went with the red, white, and blue patriotic colors of the spaceship. And uh, so, you know, it's just like they figured things out and made things work with, these uh, seemingly crazy or totally crazy solutions, but the body putty was was is wonderful. I love that story. <laughs> I mean, were there other things like that where you were finding out things that had never been reported before? I think that um, you know a lot of the personal stories certainly had never been reported before. The emotional, uh, you know, the pilot the pilots who worked for Bert Rattan, for instance, who we're all trying to be the first to get this flight to space um, and become the world's first commercial astronaut. They were kind of jockeying for position. There were three three pilots um, who wanted to do that. And that backstory, you know, and Mike Melville, who became he who becomes the world's first commercial astronaut, you know, he was 63 years old when he first white knuckles it to space. And so his story, you know, it was very personal, very emotional. You know, his wife didn't want him to fly it. Um, she was terrified the whole time, um, but she was supportive. I think it's very, you know, it shows how rough it is on the wives or spouses of test pilots. Then you have another test pilot, Brian Benny, who, you know, uh, crash landed the first supersonic flight, uh, which had been successful <laughs> until the landing. And he fights, you know, like a Rocky kind of character to get back in the ring or get back in the spaceship and fly it again. So there's a lot of personal um, drama that has never been reported before, um, you know, about the characters and the what these moments meant to them in that moment in real time. So I'm really, I really like those things as well as the the things that have never been reported about the technology, you know, the design, the uh, body putty types of things. So I think there's a mixture of those things. Well, yeah, I mean, speaking of Rocky, I mean, particularly toward the end of this book, it just feels like it was written by a Hollywood screenwriter. Like you can't imagine, you know, formulating these events any better to be more dramatic. It's just so intense. (laughs) Well, that's I know, isn't it? You know, as a writer, you're like, yes, this is, you know, Truth is so much better than fiction. Um, yeah, I was just rooting for them. And it's funny. I mean, I was writing the story, but I was also like, you feel like you watch these characters grow up where Peter, you know, he gave me 20 years worth of his private journals, um, which he unearthed and nobody has ever read. And I read those and starting when he was in high school, he was keeping these journals. And and he had audio journals that I listened to. And so I was, you know, I had seen how he had failed and how he had succeeded and failed again and, and found these amazing, unexpected ways to make this happen. And um, so at the end, you see, you see this historic moment with Peter and you see with Bert Rattan, 
you know, from this um, little shop in the Mojave Desert and doing what only the world's largest governments had done before. And you see Mike Melville and she's so proud of Brian Benny and Brian Benny gets another chance in the cockpit. And you see all these other teams who were there too, you know, the Steve Bennett's and um, Dimitri watching from afar and John Carmack and watching from afar and people coming together over this moment, you know, that happens in an, in, again, in an unexpected place in the Mojave desert where history is made. And um, it does come to come together in this really, really inspired kind of way that was just a part that was just the narrative, you know, it was not needing my direction. I just told the story that was, that was, that was there. Right. But there are these things like also with, with Peter getting his funding that are just almost too good to be true or too perfect to be true. Like Eric Lindbergh coming in to save the day. <laughs> I know. I know here he's inspired by Charles Lindbergh. Then Charles Lindbergh's grandson, Eric, um, has his own incredible journey in this story of being knocked down by a debilitating um, condition, rheumatoid arthritis, and feeling his life as he knew it is over. And then he, through the X Prize and through finding a way to deal with rheumatoid arthritis, he finds his way back and forges his own identity and and flies and does recreates this flight of his grandfather and rescues the X Prize when they need it most. And I mean, that's also an incredible part of it as you as you noted, I mean, his story within the story is, I think, really powerful. And, you know, for those who don't know the, the Lindbergh story, it's fascinating to go back and look at what Charles Lindbergh achieved, um, you know, when he was 24, 25 years old. And, you know, and also, um, you know, to look at the legacy, because the legacy was both a gift and a burden, you know, I mean, it was a very, very um, overbearing sort of legacy for Eric Lindbergh to live with. So he had to figure out how to grapple with that. And, and in the end, he did something really both reverential and rebellious and found his identity. Right. Because a lot of his family members don't want him coming, being public because there's this family history of the Lindbergh baby being kidnapped. Right. And, you know, and he was told, he was told by his siblings, um, do not do this flight. He was, this flight was, he was going to, on his grandfather's 75th anniversary of the flight, he was going to recreate that flight, you know, obviously in a, in a modern plane and with all of the, you know, telecommunications that, that, um, that we have and the comforts that we have today that his grandfather didn't have, but it was still a risky endeavor. And, he was, but the riskiness was more, as you hinted on, was more about his relationship with his family. His family just, you know, shied away from the spotlight and, you know, they were brought up to um, live very quietly and not to make anything of the Lindbergh name because it had gotten them too much fame. You know, it had, it had, the fame had brought uh, the devastation of the kidnapping and so they all were brought up with this kind of duality of, wow, great legacy. Oh, but don't make anything of it. And so it was very, very interesting to get into that world um, of, and I interviewed a number of the Lindberghs. So, you know, and they were very, very candid with me. And I think that Eric was you know, he found a lot of courage to do what, what he did, which it, which ended up saving the X prize at a key time. And, and, and just, it was validating to, to himself. You're right. So he saves it when they're in financial, dire financial straits. And then there's another thing that's almost just right out of a movie where they're, they're completely out of money and they're trying to think of some crazy scheme to save this. And they say like, well, what if we find someone who will bet us that we can't do it. And they're like, it's just so, it's so crazy. It just might work. I know. I know. Isn't that, isn't that great? The hole in one insurance. Had you ever heard of this? No, no. I mean, I hadn't either. And, but it's basically, yeah, it's, there are these companies that will, you know, bet against you that the guy who, you know, at the NBA finals, you know, picked out of the audience that, you know, he'll win a million dollars if he sinks the, you know, three quarters shot. Um, 
you know, on his first try or whatever. And the insurance company is the one who will put up the money betting against it happening. And so this idea comes to Peter, what if we get an insurance company, a hole in one insurance company to bet against us? And, and so Peter's like, well, yeah, I love the irony of that. Uh, you know, people have been betting against me uh, <laughs> in this prize from almost day one. And what if we can get them to put up the money to do this? And then they were able to do that. And, but it was still in pieces, you know, they got um, a certain amount of money from that. And then they had to raise the money for the premiums and, but the hole in one insurance money, there was another unexpected twist and <laughs> turn in this. And then you had the clock ticking and the prize money was going to run out at the end of 2004. If, um, you know, if, if um, no one succeeded. Well, right. And then the, just to fight, just to cover the insurance payments, they need a million dollars. And he's just flipping through Fortune magazine and finds uh, someone on the list of, you know, wealthiest people under 40 and sees that she her dream is to travel into outer space and kind of cold calls her. It's just all this crazy, audacious <laughs> stuff he does. I know. it. Well, he actually read about Anusha Ansari. She was she was what you mentioned in the top 40 under 40 or something like that. Um, and she had just sold a company for a lot of money. Um, and she actually said, she didn't say outer space, outer space. She said she wanted to fly into suborbit. And that's exactly what Peter was doing with the X prize. It was going to a hundred kilometers. He saw it as the first step to going to orbit. And he was like, oh my gosh, I found my, you know, my, but I found my funder. And so the Ansaris, um, Anusha and her husband and her brother-in-law came in as backers. Um, so together with the hole-in-one insurance, they had their money. And then, but he was still cold calling for, you know, cash, you know, every week to come up with the premiums. And there was the, the financial drama continued almost until the very, very, very end. Yeah, I mean, just just reading this book made me so stressed out. I can't even imagine what it was like to actually <laughs> live through that. I mean, did did you feel that when you were writing it that it made you stressed out to to write that about this a, stuff? That's a very funny comment. Yes, I did. Um, I felt badly for Peter. I felt like I was living with him then um, again because I was reading his journals, and it was just so much disappointment. You know, it was so much struggle, and so many people telling him no. And you almost start feeling protective of him, um, even though you know at the end this has, you know, that it results in something <laughs> really great. But I was like, oh, my God, isn't someone ever going to say yes to this guy? You know, he's got this dream and this passion and and this great idea and these teams who want to do this. And, you know, they want to make history. And come on, somebody just, just fund it. It was very stressful. <laughs> I mean, do you want to say a little bit more about the process of writing this book? I mean, you mentioned you interviewed all these people. Just what was it like writing it and getting it out and getting the, you know, people to talk about it and stuff like that? Oh, it was, a t it was um, the reporting was a ton of fun, actually, because I interviewed, um, oh, over 100 people in very in-depth ways. And I traveled, you know, to the Mojave Desert and I went to St. Louis and I went to Florida and I went to Seattle and met with all these folks, um, as many as I could. And I flew, you know, with, um, Mike Melville and his long easy and which is his home built plane. And, um, and I had, you know, it was a great, it was a great time and a great adventure and a ton of research. And I, you know, I did interviews with Richard Branson and Elon Musk and, um, talked to him about this whole thing. And, um, and he's in the book. He's in a couple of, he's in one, two chapters. Um, Elon, it, it just this fly on the wall scene where he's starting to think about space. The reporting was really fun. It was a very steep learning curve for me. Literally, it's rocket science. So I had a few technical, I had a few technical advisors, but I loved it. I loved being in way over my head and not knowing too much about, uh, about this. And then again, you know, reading science fiction, um, getting immersed in that world was really, really fun. And then the writing started and that was not as much fun. That was quite difficult um, and exhausting because I had about seven months actually to write the story, which was grueling. 
um, you know, I worked it out on, I, I have a process where I lay it out in on note cards and then I put them up on a huge uh, bulletin board and, and then I move them around and then I just start picking off the scenes. And, um, I had so much research, um, you know, uh, audio journals video photos multiple interviews for all these scenes i had a lot of technical journals um, that were given to me by the folks at scaled composites um by the pilots um so you know it's amazing how it, it just it just started coming together one chapter at a time and um and after it's done, and then after I have a month or two, like in this process right now, then I start to see like, wow, there are some really cool themes in here. I don't think about themes when I'm writing it. I just think about the story. So it's at a later point when you have some objectivity where you can see kind of the book from afar and you can see what the themes of the book are. So that's where I am now. Well, so, so what are the themes of the book? So I think one of the biggest ones is uh, risk, and I didn't think of that when I set out to write it, but the role of risk in our lives and risk in society and the need to take risks as individuals and collectively as a society, um, you know, if these risks hadn't been taken, whether by Peter or Eric Lindbergh or test pilots or Bert Rattan or Dimitri or all these folks, you know, it would not have advanced um, to you know, this point where history was made with the first privately built and flown spaceship. Um, and I think society would have lost. I think this is the backstory to what's happening with the commercial space industry today. Um, and then, you know, the risks, I mean, the, the, the other theme is just, you know, it's interesting what comes about in childhood and the passions that you feel um, that you know, whether it's about space or whether whatever your dream is, um, you know, Bert Rattan, he just loved planes from, you know, the, the time he was, you know, six years old and Peter Diamandis, it was space. And it's interesting to see how these pursuits, these loves that are adopted in childhood, how they can play out, um, you know, with, with, with tenacity, um, later in life. Yeah. So have Peter and Bert and those people, have they read the book? Have you gotten feedback on it from them? Peter has has read it and loves it and is going to be promoting it um, and talking about it. And um, Bert, I just saw up in Idaho last a couple of weeks ago um, and I gave him a copy of the book and and uh, I saw him about an hour later. We were at a festival. Think Big Festival in North Idaho, and he um, had tears in his eyes, Bert did. And Bert is a tough cookie. You know, I didn't know how he would react, um, but Bert had tears in his eyes, and he told me he loved it. And um, so that meant a huge amount to me. You know, he said, I had tears in my eyes. Um, you know, I mean, and he explained to me because he was reliving these moments that had meant so much to him and that had never been captured. So you know, that was, that was very meaningful to me. And others are, are reading it now. Eric Lindbergh has read his sections um, of the book. He hasn't read the entire book. And he said he was brought to tears because um, he, you know, he was so bad off in those early days when we first see him. And, you know, he almost blocked it out of his mind um, because he didn't want to acknowledge how debilitated, you know, crippled he was physically and, and becoming that way mentally. Well, I mean, I've mentioned that it just seems like it should be a movie. Have you gotten any film interest in it yet? We have. Yes, we have um, strong film interest from um, several different um, parties, and we're exploring those, um, both independent and big name um, big name, uh, producers. So we're in the midst of that right now. And I should have more news on that in stay tuned in, <laughs> in, in the next few weeks, but there's strong interest in it. You know, I, I think it's, it is very cinematic and there are these scenes that I, that I saw as I was right, you know, I could just see them. So that's a nice compliment. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, and then what what are people uh, up to now? I mean, you have a sort of a, a bit at the end where you kind of update us and everyone. I mean, people in this book talk about the future of private space stations, zero gravity hotels and all sorts of things. I mean, <laughs> how how soon can we uh, hop on a can we can we all become space tourists and fly to a zero gravity hotel? Well, so when Spaceship One, um, Bert Rattan's um, answer to private space uh, funded by Paul Allen, when that succeeded on October 4th, 2004, the intellectual property rights were purchased by um, Richard Branson, who started Virgin Galactic. And Virgin Galactic now has Spaceship Two. And they have had um, successes, and then they had a, a really, really tragic um, accident, which was a pilot error on their spaceship about a year ago, um, and they've just resumed test flights. So they are looking to fly, um, you know, they're, they're still intent on flying um, commercial paying passengers um, in, in the years to come. Um, but it's been, you know, Richard Branson is the first to say it's been slower than anyone anticipated and more difficult, but they're going to get there. He's determined. And I think they will. Um, Elon Musk, you know, is now with SpaceX. They are looking to, um, through NASA, bring, uh, NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. Elon had talked about, uh, when I interviewed him as early as 2017, I don't know if they are on track for that. Um, Jeff Bezos, who's also in the book, he was a chapter head of the Princeton SEDS, the student group that Peter founded, just as a little interesting aside. Um, but he, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon founder, he has started Blue Origin and they are doing very successfully doing suborbital um, test flights. They have not flown a person yet, but they're going suborbital first, which is what Peter had in mind with the space prize, and then and then orbital. Um, so, and there are myriad smaller space commercial commercial space companies that have that are now thriving. You know, um, that have come out of this kind of moment in time when there was, as I saw it, this inflection point in history when. Um, when spaceflight, manned spaceflight began to turn away from the government and toward private citizens. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's, go it's closer than it ever has been, and it's going in the right direction for all those space lovers, geeks, um, adventurers out there. It, and I'm among those. I really hope to fly and to get a ticket to fly. Um, now I know the right people. <laughs> 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 um, it's, you know, it's feeling, it's, you know, even those skeptical of, you know, of, of this are saying, you know, it is more advanced than it has ever been in terms of we're getting, you know, closer, closer. It feels eminent. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, when you mentioned Jeff Bezos, that just reminded me, I mean, a, a lot of there are a lot of cameo appearances in this book by people that would be of interest to our audience. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke, Tom Clancy, James Cameron, Richard Garriott, all kind of pop up throughout this book, all these fantasy and science fiction related people. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And Bezos, um, you know, he, he was a big, you know, he's been a space geek like uh, Peter was for, you know, since childhood. And um, when he met with Peter Diamandis in the late 1990s, Peter was asking him to fund the X prize and uh, Bezos had, had launched um, Amazon to great fanfare, but he was focused very much on that. But he did say, you know, he was, he was, he believed that his success through Amazon would result in or allow him to start a space company, which has proven true. And, you know, Arthur C. Clarke becomes um, a really key figure in Peter's life and in the founding, you know, he becomes the chancellor or the um, advisor to SEDS, the student group which again, Jeff Bezos was a chapter head of at Princeton when he was there. Um, and Arthur C. Clarke, you know, becomes this very friendly advisor to Peter and to Bob Richards, who now runs the Lunar, Lunar, um, uh, Google Lunar X Prize team, Moon Express, and uh, to another friend of theirs. You know, and he, you know, he tells them that 
um, make, you know, your effort um, student run, make it international when they started an international international space university. So he became a very key figure and uh, a, a steady supporter. Um, and Richard Garriott as well became a big supporter of the X Prize and his story of going to space as a commercial, um, as a paying passenger was really interesting. And he's, you know, he's doing interesting things in space today. So he's, he is a part of that. Uh, there are all of these great cameos uh, from really, really fascinating folks who, you know, they could have a chapter or book book in their own right. And then they, there are these, you know, walk on scenes and then they're, you know, and then you may not see them again or you may, but um, yeah, they have really interesting cameo appearances. And you mentioned the Google Lunar X Prize, so I just want to draw people's attention to that. There's $30 million, people. Go get it. <laughs> yeah, you better get started. Teams have been working on it for some time. But that's interesting because the Google Lunar X Prize comes out of a story I tell in the book, which is about this company called Blastoff. I don't know if you, um, if you made the connection. I don't know if people, it'll be interesting to see if people make that connection because so Peter went um, and joined in around late 1999 during or 2000, year 2000, during the dot-com heyday before the bust had occurred and joined this um, company called Idea Labs in Pasadena. And it was frantic, frenetic pace. You know, companies were being pets.com and hmm. all these, you know, companies were getting these crazy valuations. And, and Peter was asked to become the CEO he was still running the X Prize and trying to raise money, but trying to raise money was the key part. Um, he was invited to become the CEO of this company called Blastoff, which was going to send, the goal was to send a lunar lander to the moon, send a lander to the moon and have it um, um, beam images back to Earth. And this would be the first commercial lunar enterprise. So. It's similar in, I mean, the concept is, is almost identical to, um, in terms of the Google Lunar X Prize, which is for private teams to do just this, to, you know, to land, um, something on the moon, to traverse a certain distance and to transmit images back. And there's a story of, you know, kind of the, the concept of it where it took shape in year 2000 with this ill-fated company called Blastoff. Well, I thought the stuff about Blastoff was interesting because, you know, there had been a lot of discussion about the downsides of big government programs like NASA. But I thought the Blastoff showed some of the unique downsides to commercial space flight where the marketing <laughs> started wagging the dog, where, you know, they had to make all the robots cute and they're going to have kids driving them around and all this like ridiculous stuff just to try to interest the public in it that had no practical or scientific value. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was a kind of a good story just for um, the business set out there, entrepreneurs. And I mean, it was ridiculous where the marketing team, where there was a disconnect between marketing and engineering. And the marketing team was coming up with these, you know, Wally -E looking uh, robots that were friendly and they were little rovers and they were going to send them out in a team. And, and Jim Cameron with his cameo. You know, he had just come off the success of Titanic, filming the Titanic and movie, and he got involved in the Blastoff project. And his idea was you can't have one rover, which was originally their idea, but you need two because you need the second one to film um, the first one so it can show, you know, it, it can have this cinematic effect. And so then, of course, that doubles their cost because now they don't have one rover, but they have two. And then it grew to they need a family of of these rovers to look like a mother sending out her children to explore. <laughs> um, they did have really impressive engineering uh, going, but it did not at all match what the marketers were coming up with. But it was a very impressive engineering team, actually. A lot of former JPL uh, men and women. And um, so they, they were developing great technology. And, and, and some preposterous ideas came from the marketing side. <laughs> okay, so unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. Do you want to just say a little bit about, I don't know, do you have any final thoughts uh, about the book or, you know, any of the people involved or just uh, anything else you want to mention? Um, you know, I, 
I think this is a story that is great for people, whether you're, you know, nine or 99. I think that I hope it, or older, I hope that it has appeal with kind of the next generation of, um, you know, of coders, gamers, tinkers, makers, engineers, uh, where you read this and you think, uh, maybe my, you know, you think about, what is the spaceship that I'm building? You know, it doesn't, it's obviously not a spaceship, but, um, and how do I make it happen? And I think the book can be this kind of guide um, to persisting in the face of these seemingly insurmountable um, barriers. And I think it's a really fun read. Um, I think there's a ton of cool technology in it, but I hope it's very inspirational. So, Again, I, I think also that um, there should be a strong youth. I hope that the book is appealing to a young audience as well. So, I mean, do you have another spaceship you're working on now? I'm working on this. I'm solely focused on um, this spaceship only. I'm not <laughs> thinking about the next spaceship. <laughs> no, you know, I've been living and breathing and dreaming this story. And now I'm, you know, I'm so lucky I get to talk about it. Um, I seem to gravitate to these stories that are David versus Goliath struggles and, um, underdog stories and also stories that combine, um, great human drama and pursuits with technological innovations. So I'm really interested in, interested in this world of, um, man and machine and woman and machine and, and how, um, they come together to make the world, um, a better place. And so I expect to do something like that uh, with my next spaceship, whatever it is. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed the book. Like I said, it was really intense. I'm glad all these people did this stuff so that I didn't have to. And uh, I think we're going to um, wrap things up there. So uh, Julian Guthrie, we've been speaking about her book, How to Make a Spaceship. And so, Julian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for your great questions. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Julian Guthrie for joining us on the show. Special thanks as well to Emily Goodman, who just became PayPal patron number 140. I'd also like to thank David Taylor, PayPal patron number 75, who just made his second contribution to the show. David writes, Hi, Dave. Thanks for the superb and consistent work throughout the year. With the present increasingly insane and inane election cycle, I'm thinking often about the intersection of speculative fiction and politics. If your schedule allows, insights from you and yours on the subject would lighten the burden of this endless juggernaut taking us through to November. Thanks to all of you at Geek's Guide. So big thanks again to David Taylor for his contribution and for that nice note. And if anyone else out there wants to see us cover the presidential election, let us know at geeksgalaxy at gmail.com. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, Please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geekskyshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, Visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.